Okay. So thanks a lot for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm Yufeng from UIUC. And in the paper that I'm presenting today, we ask a very classical question. That is, what influences the monetary policy transmission in the banking system? And for prior papers looking at this topic, they focus on the role of regulations. They argue it is, for example, the opportunity cost imposed by the reserve requirement or the capital requirement that determines how banks are going to react to the monetary policy. And one implicit assumption that these papers are making is that the banking industry is perfectly competitive. So without these regulatory frictions, the monetary policy is going to be transmitted one to one onto the bank's lending decisions. And not until very recently do we have this emerging literature that takes an I.O. perspective on this question. They argue that banks have oligopolistic market power. And it is the strategic interaction among the competing banks that determine how sensitive they are to the monetary policy. And so far, we have papers looking at what happens on the deposit market and lending market. And they find qualitative evidence that supports this market power channel. So given where we are standing in this paper, we want to mainly address two questions. So first, we want to understand quantitatively how important is this market power channel relative to this previously studied regulation-based transmission mechanisms. And second, we want to be able to bridge the different channels and see if there is any interesting interaction that arises from there. OK, so in order to address these questions, we start by constructing a unified framework of how monetary policy is transmitted within the banking system where we have imperfect competition among banks on both the deposit and the lending market, as well as the regulatory frictions. And in addition, the banks might be facing some frictions when they try to seek funds externally. So we embed this external financing friction in the model as well. OK, then we go ahead and structurally estimate the model using bank level data. And pursuing a structural estimation approach is going to allow us to turn on and off these frictions counterfactually and see quantitatively how they influence the degree of monetary policy transmission. And while doing this exercise, we combine two different estimation strategies from different literatures. So first, we borrow from the structural I.O. literature and use the demand estimation strategy first proposed by Barry Levinson and Pecos in order to pinpoint what are the, demand, the deposit demand and loan demand systems faced by the banks? And for the remaining parameters, including the financial frictions, we estimate their value using simulated method of moments, which is commonly used in the macrofinance and the structural corporate finance literature. And by combining our estimation strategy in this way, we are able to very closely track how banks behave on the different uh, interest rate environment which makes the whole setup useful to answer questions that are quantitative in nature. OK, so without any delay, let me first very briefly summarize our model setup. So our model is an infinite horizon dynamic model where we have three key players. We have the depositors. They choose, to, uh, they choose where to invest their household wealth. We have the borrowers. They choose whether or not to borrow and whom they are going to borrow from. For both the depositors and borrowers, they make relatively simple intra-period optimization decisions. And the richness of the model lies within the banking sector, which involves making a more complicated dynamic decision on how much loans to initiate, how much deposit to intake, as well as the capital structure decision. And we have two markets in the model. We have the deposit market and we have the loan market. So next, I'm going to describe the two markets in details one by one. OK, first, we have the deposit market, where we have J oligopolistic banks competing for depositors. For each depositor, that is a household. So he has J plus two options. So first, he can choose to deposit with one of the J banks. So that counts as J differentiated options, because banks have market power and they can price their deposit differently. And of course, the household can choose to directly invest in treasury securities. That's option J plus 1. And the, the household can also choose to hold cash 
that's option J plus two. So in total, we have J plus two options. And for each investment option, it's gonna be indexed by two indices. So first, we have this thing highlighted in red. That re represents the rate of return you are able to derive from a specific investment option. So here, as we can see, Treasury security offers the highest rate of return. Uh, for bank deposit, the return is lower because banks do charge a deposit spread, and the return of cash is just a zero. And in addition to the return, the investors can also derive a convenience or liquidity from these investment options. So here, cash offers the highest level of transactional convenience, and we normalize the convenience of treasury securities to zero, and again, for bank deposit, that line was in the two extremes. Okay, now as a depositor I, uh, my utility from choosing option J is gonna be the following. So first, I get my rate of return multiplied by my rate sensitivity plus uh, the convenience plus epsilon. So here epsilon is a match specific preference shock. So it captures the idea that holding the type of investment and the, and the rate of return constant. For example, as a depositor, I'm more likely to go with a bank if the bank has a local branch in my neighborhood. So in that case, we say me and that bank has a high epsilon, a high match specific preference shock. So from the bank's perspective, this is what allows the bank to have a market power. Because in this case, the bank can increase the spread to above the competitors without having to worry that he's gonna lose me as a customer, okay? So next, we model the lending market in a symmetric way, where we have the same set of J banks competing for borrowers. Uh, for each borrower, again, he has J plus two options. He can choose to take a loan from one of the J banks. He can choose to directly flow corporate bond or not to make any investment at all. And uh, the firm, they are gonna choose among these J plus two discrete choices in order to maximize their profit from the lending market, which is going to be the return of borrowing, which allows the firm to make investment, minus any flotation cost if they're doing corporate bond, minus the borrowing rate being charged. And on the lending market, again, we introduce this epsilon, which is a match specific preference shock and the aim is to capture any firm bank specific lending relationship. Okay, now from the bank's perspective, he can simply aggregate over the household and the firm's choices in order to obtain what is his overall deposit demand and loan demand. Okay, now let's start our analysis from the simplest case. Let's assume that now there's no friction of any kind and the banks do not have any market power. So in this case, the competitive force on the market is gonna make sure that the deposit rate and loan rate offered by the banks are gonna converge to the federal funds rate. Next, we introduce market power. When there's a market power, this is gonna allow the banks to charge a spread. In particular, when the federal funds rate increases, the spread that the banks are able to charge is gonna react. So with higher federal funds rate, that means it is more costly for the household to hold cash. So in this case, cash becomes less attractive relative to the investment option of uh, investing in bank deposit. So because bank deposit now becomes more attractive, that allows the bank to behave as if they have greater market, great power on the deposit market. So banks are gonna charge a higher deposit spread. So on the loan market, what happens is when the interest rate increases holding all else equal, the bank, uh, bank loans become less attractive because the firms are more inclined to go with their outside option of not taking any loans and make an investment. So in this case, bank becomes less powerful on the loan market and that decreases their profit margin. So in the data, what happens is indeed we see that when the federal funds rate increases, there is an increasing and monotonic relationship between the deposit spread that the banks are able to charge and the underlying federal funds rate. And on the loan market, we see the opposite relation. So this is consistent with the prediction of the market power channel. 
So if we do not have the market power, then there shouldn't be any systematic pattern between the spreads and the underlying federal funds rate. And in fact, the spread that banks are able to charge should be a constant, which reflect the bank's marginal cost to operate on the two markets. This is not what we see in the data. So in the data, this observation actually indicate that banks are actively choosing their pricing strategy when their market power differs on the different federal fund rate environment. Okay. So in particular, the banks are gonna choose their pricing strategy and their capital structure in order to maximize their discounted cash dividend to their shareholders. And the cash dividend can come from several sources. So it can come from the profit from the deposit market, the profit from the lending market, or a change in the company's, in the bank's retained earnings. And while doing this, the banks are facing frictions from several sources. So first we have the regulatory constraints, which says at any given point in time, the equity value of the bank has to be a higher than a given fraction kappa of the total amount of loans outstanding. And at the same time, the bank will have to hold theta fraction of the deposit as deposit reserves. Uh, in addition, the banks are also facing financial frictions. So most importantly, when the amount of internal liquidity within the bank plus deposit are not able to support the total amount of lending, then the bank will have to go to the wholesale funding market and borrow non-reservables, which is costly. And second, we have, of course, the maturity mismatch on the bank's balance sheet. So here, the liability is one year, and for the asset, it is long term, okay? And notice here, without any of the frictions, the deposit and loan markets are gonna act as two disaggregated markets. Namely, the banks are gonna make their independent decisions on the two markets. Now, with the frictions, they serve to interconnect the two markets, and as a result, the market power that banks are able to enjoy on the deposit market is going to be transmitted onto their optimal lending decisions. Okay, so this is the model. Next, we are going to go ahead and estimate it. As I mentioned, I'm going to divide my estimation into two, strategies, into two stages. In the first stage, the aim, uh, we aim to estimate the deposit and loan demand system. Especially, we want to pinpoint what are the rate sensitivities that the banks are facing on the deposit and lending market, which is very important because it is the most direct measure for the market power that banks are able to enjoy on these markets. So to do this, we follow the strategy proposed by Barry Levinson and Pecos, and more specifically, we estimate a random coefficient logic model, and we use the bank's salary and the expense of fixed asset as cost shifters. So here, our identification assumption is the following. For example, if I am a borrower of a bank, uh, I care about what rate I'm being charged. In addition, I care about features such as how many branches the bank has in the city and how many employees per branch. Now, after controlling for those features, I don't directly care about the bank's cost of operation. As a result, uh, this cost the shifters they influence the bank's ability to make loans, but at the same time, it leaves the demand curve unchanged. And as, as a result, it allows us to trace what is the slope of the demand curve. And here's our result. So first, from the table, we can see that on both the deposit and lending market, uh, we have a significant uh, rate sensitivity. So for example, if we look at this number in the first column, it says if the bank increased their deposit rate by 1%, this is gonna increase their deposit market share by 0.9 percentage point, which is roughly a 20% increase in the deposit base of a bank. So, we, so that is a quite sizable effect. But at the same time, these estimates are very different from a perfectly competitive case. So here we are measuring the market share as the percentage so if the markets are perfectly competitive, we should be seeing that this coefficient shooting up to 100, which means if you change your deposit and loan rate by 1%, this is gonna cause you to, le to lose the whole market or capture the whole market. So this is, what, this is not what we have in the table. And that again highlights the idea that banks do seem to have sizable market power 
on both the deposit and the loan markets. Okay. So next, we move on to the second stage, where we estimate the remaining parameters in the model, including the financing cost. These are the parameters that governs the bank's intertemporal decisions. And we estimate their value using simulated method of moments, where the idea is the following. So first, we start with some conjectured parameters. And based on the parameters, we solve the model, and we simulate a panel of banks. Based on the simulated data, we are going to calculate some important moments. And we are going to do the exact same with the actual data. We are going to choose our parameters so that we minimize the distance between the model and the data, and that's how we get our second stage estimates. Okay, and here's the result. So first, our estimates suggest that banks face a significant marginal cost to operate on both the deposit and the lending market. And second, the banks are also facing a significant external financing friction. And this is reflected by two parameter estimates in the table. So first, we can directly look at our estimate for the quadratic external financing cost. So this parameter here, it implies that for a medium bank, they have to pay an additional 30 bips as external financing cost when they try to get one additional dollar from this wholesale funding market, which is quite sizable. And second, we, this is also reflected by the bank's discount rate. Uh, if there's no frictions, then the bank should be using the long-term federal funds rate as the discount rate, uh, which is about 2.5% in our sample. And this is a lot lower than the actual discount rate that we estimate in the model. So again, this is also to say that the banks are facing some substantial frictions when they make their intertemporal decisions. Okay. So now we have all the parameter estimates. Our last task is to plug these parameter estimates back into the model and examine how the model solution looks like. Okay. So here on this graph, I'm plotting uh, the aggregate bank lending in the economy, which is our key variable of interest, as a function of the underlying federal funds rate. So from the graph, we can see that two results are evident. First, overall, there's a negative relation between the federal funds rate and aggregate bank lending, which is the conventional wisdom that if you see a contractionary monetary policy, this is going to decrease bank lending. So using our model, first, we want to be able to understand what forces are behind this negative relation and to what extent they are contributing to the relation that we see in the data. And second, we can see that in this low federal fund rate region, the effect of the monetary policy actually gets reversed. So here, a further cut in the federal funds rate actually creates a contractionary effect on aggregate bank lending. So using the model, we also want to be able to understand what is driving this reversal rate effect in the low federal fund rate environment. Okay. So first, we start with the overall negative relation. And in our model, it predicts that if we have a 1% increase in the federal funds rate, this is going to lead the total bank lending to decrease by roughly 1.55%. Uh, in the data, if we run the VAR, the number we get is roughly 1.6%. So although we are not directly targeting at this moment, after we have these regulatory frictions and with the estimated degree of market power that banks have, we can see that our model prediction very naturally parallels what we have in the data. Okay, so next, in order to understand what is behind this 1.6%, we start by removing these frictions we embed in the model one by one and see how the resulting monetary policy transmission is going to change when a specific friction becomes absent. Okay, so first, we get rid of the reserve requirement. So once that happens, we can see that there's only a minor decrease in the monetary policy transmission, which means the reserve requirement has a relatively minor effect. So we know that after the financial crisis, the government has been paying a quite competitive rate on the bank reserves. And we have arguments saying this shouldn't be happy, happening because it's going to make uh, the monetary policy less, of, uh, less effective. So here we are arguing that this kind of worry is kind of unwarranted because for the reserve requirement, 
it has never been a very important transmission channel, at least in the recent decade. So next, we remove the capital regulation. When that happens, we can see that the monetary policy transmission goes down from 1.55 to roughly 1.1%. So this is the conventional wisdom that uh, with the capital regulation, when there is an increase in the federal funds rate, the maturity mismatch on the bank's balance sheet is going to cause the asset side to decrease more than the liabilities. As a result, the capital regulation, if this regulation is in place, is going to be more binding, which constrains the amount of lending that banks can do. So following that, we remove the bank's market power on the deposit market. When that happens, the monetary policy transmission goes down from 1.55% in the baseline case to almost one to one in a case where we do not have deposit market power. So this is also to say for the deposit market power, it has a strong enhancing effect on monetary policy transmission. And intuitively, this is because when the interest rate becomes higher, the bank deposit becomes relatively more attractive compared with cash. As a result, banks are going to behave as if they are more powerful on the deposit market. They are going to behave more like a monopolist by increasing their markup and lower the quantity of deposit intake. And this is the picture that I showed you before. We can see that indeed the deposit spread widens substantially when the federal fund rate becomes higher. So uh, for the banks, because they are also facing this external financing friction, so they cannot costlessly re uh, replace this lost deposit. And as a result, the lending will have to react. That's why we see this deposit market has a strong enhancing effect on monetary policy transmission, which has something to do with the bank's deposit market power. Okay, so last, we remove the uh, bank's market power on the lending market. When that happens, we can see that there is this uh, opposite effect. So without the loan market power, the monetary policy transmission actually becomes stronger, which is also to say the loan market power has a dampening effect on the monetary policy transmission. Why? Well, this is because when the uh, uh, interest rate increases, that makes bank loans relatively less attractive because holding all as equal, the firms are going to go with their outside option of not borrowing. As a result, the bank will have to optimally react to that by, uh, by lowering their loan spread. So to put it differently, in this case, the banks are using their market power to partially absorb these monetary policy shocks instead of uh, transmitting the shocks onto their, their customers. Okay. So lastly, if we compare the different transmission channels, we can see that quantitatively, the market power channel is at least as important as uh, the regulation-based uh, mechanism that has been uh, emphasized a lot in the, in the previous literature. Okay. So next, we want to move on and look at what happens in this ultra-low interest rate environment. So in this case, we can see that uh, a further decrease in the federal funds rate actually has the opposite effect on bank lending. And in order to understand this effect, again, we have to look at what happens on the deposit market. So in this region, when the Fed cuts the interest rate, it's going to make bank deposit relatively less attractive compared with cash, which offers a zero return. And this effect is going to be intensified uh, in this ultra-low interest rate environment. So think about a case. If the federal fund rate is zero, then the bank cannot offer any positive deposit rate to their depositors. At the same time, the bank deposit is not as liquid or as convenient as directly holding cash. So the combination of the two is going to put bank deposit at a strict disadvantage. So as a result, the bank's profit margin on the deposit market will be squeezed, and the capital regulation becomes more binding, which shrinks the amount of lending that banks can do. So to put it differently, it is the bank's deposit market power plus the capital regulation that has created this unexpected reversal rate effect in this low federal fund rate environment. Now we have this prediction. Next, we want to see if there is any supportive evidence that we can find in the data. 
So to do that, we look at what, what happens on the FOMC dates. So if everything indeed operates through the profit margin channel, we should expect the effect to be reflected by the bank stock return as well. So here in this graph, we have the banking industry access stock return on the y-axis, and we have the monetary policy shock on the x-axis. And we start our analysis with a relatively high federal fund rate environment. And as we can see here, a positive monetary policy shock is going to decrease the bank returns, which is consistent with our conventional wisdom. So next, we move on and look at what happens in the ultra-low interest rate environment. In this case, we can see that the relationship actually flips. So in this case, a further cut in the federal fund rate is going to lower the bank's profit margin and decrease their valuation. Okay. So next, we want to put everything in a regression analysis and try to tie this result more closely to the bank's market power. So in order to do that, we run the regression where we have, again, the bank return on the FOMC dates at the individual bank level as the left-hand side variable. And on the right-hand side, we have the monetary policy shock interacted with a proxy for the bank's market power, which is the Herfindahl index of the banking industry at the county level. So from the result, first we can see that the effect indeed reverse for the low interest rate environment. And that the effect is going to be a lot stronger in regions with higher bank concentration, which is, again, a supportive of the idea that the reversal rate is closely related to the bank's market power. And uh, for this result, it actually also offers an uh, interesting intuition for us to understand what happens in the recent financial crisis. So we can see that for the most recent financial crisis, if we compare that with the previous ones, uh, the bank loans recover at a much slower pace. And it is the same case no matter how we scale these variables. So once the economy dips into the recession, the Fed has cut the interest rate pretty aggressively. We see that for the deposit, it keeps increasing. while for the bank loans, they failed to catch up. And of course, there could be many possible explanations underlying this pattern. And one of which we believe is related to the bank's market power. So what happens is, for this ultra-low interest rate, it makes bank deposit relatively less competitive compared with cash or other uh, zero-return investment options. As a result, the bank profit margin will be squeezed, and that decreases the valuation of the banks, which in return constrains the amount of lending that banks can do. And at the same time, we have separate papers documenting that Banks' valuation ratio indeed decreased a lot during the same sample period, and the decline is more concentrated among banks who are more reliant on their deposit services. Okay. So let me conclude. Uh, in this paper, we ask the question of does bank market power influence the transmission of monetary policy? And hopefully by now I can convince you that the answer is a yes. The effect is quantitatively quite large, and it also interacts with the regulatory frictions to create an unexpected reversal rate effect in this ultra-low interest rate environment. Okay, thanks a lot.